Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Good morning, Christ Community Church. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you all who braved the white death and made it here, the elect, those who are truly going to heaven, God bless you and keep you. Uh, anyone who's not here that you see, tell, call them, tell them to repent. This is Ohio, for goodness sakes. We are not scared of snow. In Ohio, we have two seasons, orange cones and white. That's what we have, right? So come on. Uh, I saw it on Facebook. I don't know. Should I get out on the roads today? Oh, come on. There's not six inches out there. There's a dusting out there. All right. So we are starting a brand new sermon series um, this morning called The Road to Bethlehem. And this will take us up to our Christmas Eve service to the birth of Christ. And what I'm going to argue this morning is the road to Bethlehem actually begins in Genesis and runs all the way up into the Gospels. So before I get to that, I just like to say, I don't care how cold it is. I know it's cold, it's windy, we've had some snow, but this has been a great, great weekend. Kentucky won and Duke lost. What else can you ask from a weekend, right? Ah, oh, it's been marvelous. Anyway, so Jesus himself stated in the Gospel of John, John 5, 39, and your bulletin may not have that right, that's my mistake. My laptop, my seven-year-old laptop went to be with Satan a couple weeks ago, and, and I'm waiting for my new one to come in, so I had to write out uh, my sermon notes for Paula to type up, and, and my handwriting is worse than any doctor you've ever met, so it's like trying to decipher hieroglyphics, but anyway, 
it's 539. That's what we're going to start looking at this morning. John 539, and Jesus is speaking to teachers of the law in Israel, and he says this. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me. Now, when Jesus is speaking, the only scriptures they have are the Old Testament. They don't have the New Testament yet. They have the Old Testament. They have Genesis to Malachi. That's what they have. And he is saying that all the scriptures, Genesis to Malachi, testify about me. Some translations say all those books point to me. And they do. Now, you can go to specific prophecies throughout the Old Testament. In Genesis 3, there's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Isaiah is littered with prophecies about Jesus Christ. Isaiah says there will be a child born of a virgin, all that kind of stuff, a long time before Jesus comes along. But I'm not talking about prophecies this morning. Those are easy. Those are pretty easy. You can go online, you can Google top prophecies about Christ, and it'll give you a long list, and you can look those up. And I'm not talking about how, like, big, huge segments of the Old Testament point to Jesus Christ. One of my favorite books is a, is a book, it's a little book called Look to the Rock by a guy named Alec Motyer, M-O-T-Y-E-R. He talks about how the law points to Jesus, how the kingship points to Jesus, how the prophets point to Jesus. And it's a great book, and you can look that stuff up too, but that's not what I'm talking about this morning. I am saying that if you read the Old Testament carefully, every single passage, every single story in some way, shape, or form points to Jesus Christ. I promise you it does. And I'm going to run through a few of these this morning. I can't get to all of them. We don't have the time. We will be out of here by 1145, I promise you. But I want to take a look at a few. First one is this, Adam. Now, most of you know the story of Adam and Eve. You have Adam, you have Eve. They're in the Garden of Eden. They're living in a paradise. They have a direct relationship with God. God actually physically walks through the garden among them. They have this amazing relationship with God. And they're given a really simple command. Here's the deal, Adam and Eve. You have this paradise. You take care of it. And the only thing I ask of you, don't eat from that tree. That tree represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I remember reading that as a young Christian in 1997 when I first came to Christ and thinking, what's the big deal? Who cares if they eat from that one tree? tree of knowledge of good and evil. Isn't it a good thing to have a knowledge of good and evil? And, and, and what I had a Bible professor tell me, he said, the answer is actually no. He said, actually, one of the biggest questions the Bible asks again and again and again is God looking to the people he has created and loved and said, will you trust me? Will you just trust me? I will tell you what to do, just trust me. Because, and, and my wife um, spoke in chapel at KCU this week just, and hit it out of the park. She did a great job. And, and, and she brought this up in her chapel speech. She said, you know, one of the reasons God doesn't want them to eat the knowledge, tree of the knowledge of good and evil is if you have a knowledge of good and evil, you know then what sin is, and then you know you can commit sin. The moment you have the knowledge of good and evil along with free will, you have the possibility of evil. And God did not want evil to enter his creation. It's not what he wanted. He saw it coming, but it's not what he wanted. And so Adam is just given this one command. He says, Adam, understand that as long as you do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you just trust me, you will have access to the tree of life, which will give you eternal life. And what does he do? If you read Genesis 3 carefully, what happens is Satan comes walking in and tempts Eve. And Eve takes the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and eats. And Adam is standing right there. Adam tries to throw Eve under the bus. It was the woman you gave me, God. And Eve's like, it wasn't me, it was, the, it was Satan. And Satan is actually the only one going, yep, caught me. He's the only one not making excuses. And so 
you have this situation where Adam is told, just trust me, don't eat of this tree, and you'll have access to the tree of life. Now, Jesus comes along, and he is told by his father, obey me, and you will get the tree of death so that others who have betrayed you will have the tree of life. And he obeys. Jesus is the new and perfect Adam. He is the one who obeys, even though it gets him nothing but pain and suffering and benefits others. You see, you're tracking, do you see where I'm going with this? Jesus is the new and perfect Abel. Now, in Genesis 4, you get the story of Cain and Abel, two of Adam and Eve's kids. Probably not the only ones they had, but two of them. And they're brothers, and and Cain is, they're both farmers, and and, and Cain is jealous of his brother Abel. Abel was a righteous person. What Hebrews later, later tells us, the book of Hebrews, is that Abel, when he brought his sacrifices to God, he did so gladly. He did so in faith. He did so because he wanted to. Cain did so reluctantly. He's a grumpy guy. And so he brings his, his, his sacrifice to God reluctantly, and God says, I'm not taking that. You don't want to give it to me? I'm not taking it. And he gets mad because he accepts Abel's sacrifice. So he says, Abel, take a walk with me. Now, if you learn nothing from this story, if you have an older brother, they ask you to take a walk, say no. And so they take a walk, and Cain kills Abel. And God comes along and says, hey, Cain, where's your brother? And by the way, when God asks you a question, he's not seeking information. He already knows what happened. What he is seeking, he's trying to give you a chance to confess and repent. And so he asks Cain, where's your brother? And he says, I don't take care of my brother. It's not my responsibility. And he says, Cain, your brother's blood cries out for justice. Now, if you've read the story, you know that despite what Cain has done, he gets mercy. He really gets mercy. But when Abel, a righteous person, sheds his blood, what his blood does is cry out for justice. But then Jesus comes along, and he is a righteous man, the only truly perfect righteous man. And when his blood is shed, it cries out for forgiveness, not justice. We don't get justice as Christians, and thank God for that. If we got justice, we'd be in a lot of trouble. We get mercy and forgiveness because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ is the new and perfect Abel. Christ is the new and perfect Abraham. If you know the story of Abraham in Genesis 12, everything has gone to pot. And you have the Tower of Babel, everything is back in chaos, and God says, Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave your father's house. I want you to go to a land you've never been to. You don't know what's going to happen to you. But if you do it, I will bless you. I will bless, in fact, not only will I bless you, I will bless anyone who blesses you, and I will curse anyone who curses you. And so this is a time when families stuck together. Whole generations lived together. Back then, it was normal for grandparents parents, sons, children, grandchildren, all that kind of stuff, to stick together for their entire lives and take care of one another. Now we call people who live in their parents' homes millennials. Back then it was normal. And so he is told, leave your father's house, go to an unknown place. And he does it. He doesn't know what's going to happen other than God says, but I will bless you. But Jesus is the new and perfect Abraham because Jesus is told, leave your throne, my son. Go to earth where you will be betrayed, you will be tortured, you will be murdered. You will not be blessed, you will be cursed so that others may be blessed, and he does it. Jesus is the new and perfect Abraham. Jesus is the new and perfect Isaac. And the story of Isaac, it's a weird story. Abraham is an old man. His wife, Sarah, is is an older woman, well beyond childbearing age for that time. And they want a child. In that day and age, a child was a symbol of blessing. You wanted the family to continue. 
and they don't have a child, and they pray to God for a child, and God shows up and says, I will give you a child, and they, Sarah literally laughs, are you kidding me, do you see how old I am? Which God responds, do you really think anything's impossible for me, Sarah? And so they have a child, they have Isaac, he is beloved, he is treasured, he is cherished. Abraham and Sarah would lay down their own lives gladly for Isaac. Most of you parents know what I'm talking about. And then God comes along one day and says, Hey, Abraham, here's the deal. You're going to take Isaac, you're going to take him up on this mountain, and you're going to sacrifice him to me. Now, again, going to the book of Hebrews, the New Testament helps us all interpret the Old Testament. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Abraham had faith that even if he had to kill his child, God would resurrect his child because he had promised him that child. But still, even though Abraham is marching up that mountain with his son, and he believes his son will be resurrected, think about the horror as a parent of driving a knife into your own child and setting them on fire. Because that is what he is commanded to do as a sacrifice. Even if you thought you would get them back, that's a horrific thing to undergo. And yet Abraham does it. And in fact, Isaac complies. He says, where's the sacrifice? Abraham says, God will provide. And then he lets him in on it. If that had been me, I'd run the 40 in record time. Isaac, on the other hand, gathers up the wood for his own burning and carries it to his own site of sacrifice and lays down to die. The angel comes and stops Abraham, says, no, don't kill your child. And basically what God is doing there, because God doesn't need information, what God is doing is letting Abraham know the kind of faith he has. That despite the fact that he has cherished Isaac, he has waited for Isaac for so long, he now has Isaac. He knows now in his heart, Abraham does, that he loves God more than he loves his son. That his son has not become an idol. And by the way, that's common even today. All you have to do is go to a little league ball field and see how fathers idolize their sons, who they are absolutely convinced in the eighth grade are going to be drafted by the Reds. And that's why they scream at the ref and the coach and they make butts out of themselves and all that kind of stuff. Because they're idolizing their children. They're making a god out of their children. They're placing their child above the Lord himself. But Isaac's sacrifice, let's say Abraham went through with it and sacrificed Isaac. What does that accomplish? It only accomplishes Abraham knowing he has a certain amount of faith and Isaac knows he has a certain amount of faith, and that's it. God says to Jesus, son, you too will carry your wood to your execution site. But the angels will not stop it. You will be sacrificed but your sacrifice will save others. Your sacrifice will not just give faith to two, but to millions. Because Jesus is the new and perfect Isaac. Jesus is the new and perfect Jacob. If you've read the story of Jacob in Genesis, you know a couple things. One, you would never buy a used car from Jacob. He is not the most honest dude. Today, if Jacob were alive, he'd probably be in Congress. Jacob is a selfish swindler, and, and, and he's Isaac's son, one of his sons. And one time, he's out in the middle of nowhere, and an angel of the Lord shows up. And Jacob, being Jacob, instead of sitting down and talking to him, he begins to wrestle with him. I would love to have paid to have seen that. That would have been better than Triple H versus The Rock any day. And so he's wrestling with an angel, and he tells the angel, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so he gets a blessing, because Jacob's always after a blessing. Jesus comes along, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, which some of you have been to Israel, I've been there, you've seen it. The Garden of Gethsemane, it's still there. It looks directly over onto the temple Mount. So when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and he is literally wrestling with his father, he is saying, is there any other way for this to be done but your will, not my will? 
He could see the soldiers coming down from the temple because with their torch lights, you could see them coming down off the mount, go, marching to the Garden of Gethsemane. He could see his arrest, torture, and death inching toward him second by second. And he's praying and he's wrestling with God so fervently, he is literally sweating blood, which physicians say is actually a condition that happens when you're under extreme stress. Because what he was about to go through was absolutely horrific. Not only would he be hit, beat, kicked, have large thorns driven into his head, he would have been flogged with a cat of nine tails. And we know from ancient historians that typically when they did that, they opened the back to the point where you could see the vital organs. And then he carried his cross to his own site of execution. He knew what was coming. He was wrestling with God, but he does not say, God, my Father, I will do this if you bless me. He knew he would be cursed to bless others, and he obeyed. Jesus is the new and perfect Jacob. Jesus is the new and perfect Moses. Now, Moses is an interesting guy. He's a Hebrew child. He ends up an adopted son of an Egyptian princess. He grows up raised as an Egyptian prince. But he knows who he is because his own mother and sister nursed him as an aide to the princess. He knows he's a Hebrew. And one day he sees a Hebrew slave being mistreated, so he kills an Egyptian. Now he's in trouble. The Pharaoh could get away with that, but a prince cannot do that because he has killed a servant of the Pharaoh. He's in trouble. So he takes it on the run. He goes, hangs out in the wilderness for 40 years. God comes to him and says, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back into Egypt, and you're going to be my spokesman, and we're going to set my people free. And Moses argues with God. Never a good idea, by the way. You may not like it, but arguing with him is going to get you nowhere. In fact, he finally gets to the point where God says, we're done talking, move. And he goes. And he takes this group of Israelites out of Egypt, out into the wilderness. And if you've read the book, you know this is a stubborn bunch of people. They are a royal pain in the butt. They're constantly complaining. Moses disappears for 40 days. He's up communicating with God, talking about the law, taking down the Ten Commandments, speaking to God with it, about this. And while they're gone, they actually go ahead and create a false god to worship because it's like, ah, Moses has disappeared. Maybe some ate him. And God says, I tell you what, Moses, here's what we're going to do. You step aside. I'm going to kill all of them. And I'm just going to start over with you. And Moses, to his credit, even though these people have been nothing but a pain to him, goes to the Father and says, please don't do that. If for no other reason the Egyptians will see it, they'll speak badly of you, please relent. And God relents. Now, what is God doing there? Because God never changes his mind. That's also scripture. So what is God doing there with Moses? He is teaching Moses to love his people and pray for his people. That's what he's doing. And then Moses leads the people of God to the promised land. What does Jesus do when he comes along? Jesus is even more poorly treated than Moses was. Even his closest 12 friends abandon him. Nobody is there for him. And yet, what does he do on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus did not have to be taught to pray for his people. It flowed naturally out of him, even on the cross. Jesus is the new and perfect Moses. Jesus is the new and perfect David. Now, before I get into this, I have... I, I, uh, some of you heard me rant about this. This is a pet peeve. I cannot stand the way we have typically done children's ministry where the adults come in here and we talk about the New Testament and the kids go back there and learn about the Old Testament and we try to turn the Old Testament uh, stories into Disney movies. 
right? Talking donkeys, talking snakes, sounds like a Pixar movie, let's roll with it. And so we do that. But folks, if you think that the Old Testament is the kid's Bible, you have not read the Old Testament. You can't read the book of Judges to your kids. There's literally a scene where a prostitute is chopped up into bits. Explain that to Junior. Sit down and try to read the Old Testament to your kids at night. I dare you. Are you seriously going to sit there? They're about ready to fall asleep, and you're in the book of Exodus. You go, and then the angel of death killed every firstborn child in Egypt. Good night, buddy. Good night. Sleep tight. God loves you. That kid's going to be like, Daddy, can you put some blood on my door? Um, <laughs> you can't do that. The Old Testament is not a bunch of kids' stories. It's a very serious story about God's faithfulness, our unfaithfulness, and how it points to Jesus Christ. And sometimes it's brutal. It's just brutal. I mean, the same thing with the story of the one of the stories we love to tell our kids, David and Goliath. David shows up. There's Goliath. Now, the average height of an Israeli man about that time was probably about five foot tall. Right? They didn't, we didn't start getting really over 5'5 five five until the 19th century when we started drinking milk a lot and all that kind of stuff. It, it just didn't happen. We didn't know about nutrition. We ate a lot of bread, which is bad for you, all that kind of stuff. And so we didn't know. And so they're looking like, if you were looking at the Jewish army at the time David's walking around, it would look like a hobbit village. They were little people. And then you got Goliath over there looking like Shaquille O'Neal before he did the general commercials, back when he was in shape. And, there, and he's taunting them because back then what the armies would do is they'd come together, but they'd often pick one champion and say, okay, there's no reason for us to slaughter each other wholesale. You pick a champion, we'll pick a champion, we'll, they'll fight it out, and whoever wins, wins the war. And Goliath comes out there and says, who's going to be the champion? And the Jews are like, uh. They're staring at their shoes. They're walking. They don't want to go out and face him. And David comes forward and says, listen to this guy. This guy's mocking the Lord. And he said, if the Lord's with us, it doesn't matter who we send out there. We're going to win. God has promised we'll victory. Let's go. And so David goes out there. And he kills him. And, and he kills Goliath. And by the way, again, notice in that story, if you're reading that to your kids, he then chops his head off. It's like the last scene from Friday the 13th. It's gory stuff. But David did not go and face Goliath because, you know, uh, he was just, he had killed bears, he killed lions, this guy's no problem. He did it because he said, this is the army of the Lord. And he knew he would be victorious. Jesus is told, go and face Satan himself, and you will lose. But the people of the Lord will have victory, and he obeys. David, they wrote songs about him. They praised him. He gets to marry a princess. They, they give him all kinds of stuff for his victory, for his faith. What does Jesus get for his faith and his victory? nothing he gets us but he doesn't need us he is the new and perfect David finally last one I'll bring up Jesus is the new and perfect Jonah now you've heard me say this before I have another pet peeve with the story of Jonah because when we talk about the story of Jonah what do we talk about the whale the whale is an insignificant part of that story. The whale is nothing but cheap transportation. That's it. That's all that whale is doing. The whole story is this. God has said, okay, the Ninevites will repent if one of my prophets preaches to them. But all the prophets, especially Jonah, go, I'm not preaching to them. They are nasty people. They've been at war with us. They're barbarous. They torture. They kill. They don't deserve mercy. I'm not going. Again, bad idea to say no to God. Jonah tries to run. Bad idea. You have a God who controls the weather. It's a bad idea. 
And so finally he is thrown off the boat, the whale picks him up, literally pukes him onto, onto shore. I can't imagine how Jonah smelled. And he walks into the city and he starts to preach and they repent. And then Jonah gets upset. There's this mass repentance. There's this revival in Nineveh, and he's upset. You have never seen a preacher so angry at his own success. And he goes, he looks to God, he says, I knew you would do this, just like you. People repent, you have mercy. And God says to Jonah, Jonah, I made those people. They're my people, too. I have watched them grow from the womb to where they are now. What do you expect me to do? See, we miss the whole point of Jonah. It's not about the whale. The point of the book of Jonah is God loves the Ninevites too. We have people we hate. God doesn't hate them. I don't care who they are. I don't care what their politics are. I don't care what stupid ideology they bought it. I don't care what their past is. There are people on death row who have done horrific things in this country. God loves them too. The whole point of the book of Jonah is God loves the people we don't love. But for Jesus, for Jesus, who also spent three days in death, he did not have to struggle to love these people. He volunteered to go preach to them. He went to them willingly, hoping they would repent, praying for them, as I said, even on the cross. Jesus is the new and perfect Jonah. All scripture, even the Old Testament, point to Jesus Christ. I could go on and on. Nehemiah, all the prophets, over and over again. Solomon, so forth. They all point to Jesus Christ. Everything points to Jesus Christ. All morality, all creation point to Jesus Christ. You ever thought about this? How weird it is that we have this desire for justice for other people? That when we watch the news and we see someone wronged, we get angry, we get indignant. Why is that? If we're just the random products of mutation, as the Darwinists claim we are, if we're just a higher order of primate, what do we care about other people? I heard someone say this once, you never see a monkey, a chimpanzee, get upset that another chimpanzee has lost a banana. If one chimp chimpanzee walks up to another chimpanzee and grabs a piece of fruit out of their hand and starts to eat it, you don't see all the other chimpanzees go, whoa, 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 dude, not cool. They don't do that. What do they do? They just sit there and throw their poo and all that kind of stuff and just, you know, and they chatter and they, they don't care. They don't care. Why? Because they're animals. They don't care. Why do we care? Why do we care when some high-profile trial is on TV and a verdict comes in that we don't agree with and we get mad and we get indignant? Why? If we're just animals and our only concern is food and shelter and reproduction, why do we care? We care because we're not animals. We are made in the image of and likeness of God. We are different. That points to something beyond ourselves. Einstein, Albert Einstein proved time, space, and matter all had a beginning. The universe had a beginning. And nothing does not create something, which means something outside of time, space, and matter had to create it. That's just common sense. Einstein was an agnostic. He didn't necessarily believe in God. And when he finished his theory that he couldn't argue with, he, it, he actually said it irritated him. Because he knew he had opened the door to a scientific view that God exists. And then if you take the next step, then okay, if God exists and there's a creator out there, who is it? Buddhism doesn't have an answer. Most religions don't. Hinduism doesn't have an answer. Only Christianity has a logical, consistent answer to that, to where morality comes from, to where the universe 
comes from. All creation, all morality points to Jesus Christ. Hebrews, again, Hebrews is a thick book, but Hebrews says that actually the entire universe exists because Jesus wills it. It's all about him. All scripture, all creation, all morality, all philosophy, Everything points to Jesus Christ because it's all about him. Now, if it's all about him, here's the logical conclusion from that. It's not about you. It is not about us. The opening line to Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life, it's not about you. If it's all about Jesus, that means, one, we don't own anything, we're renting. It all belongs to him including you. You belong to him. And, and I'm preaching to myself here because it's so easy to lapse into selfishness and thinking it's all about me. It's all about what I want to eat, what I want to do, what I want to wear, how I want to look like, the people I want to be around. It's all about me. And if you don't think that people out there are in that mindset where they think it's all about me, just go to Kroger today and try getting out of the parking lot. Right? Just drive through New Boston, for goodness sake. I told you a story. I've had, I don't know how many people come over into my lane, almost hit me. I honk or say something, say, dude, you got to hit me. And then they look over at me irritated and sometimes flip me off. I'm like, what did I do? I just helped you avoid a wreck. But what is that? That's ego, that's selfishness, because we live in a culture where we think it's all about me. But what Genesis to Revelation, what the universe, what we feel inside when we see injustice, all points not to us, but to Jesus Christ. And so what you have to ask yourself is every day, how can you give more and more of your life to Jesus Christ? How can you pray more, give more, and get less? John the Baptist was not a perfect guy. He was not. I loved it when John the Baptist is put in jail, and he tells his disciples, um, go ask my cousin Jesus, are you the one or is there another? And the reason he's asking that is, uh, they're getting ready to chop off my head. Could you get this whole kingdom of God thing going, like, really quick? John the Baptist wasn't perfect, but he put it perfectly when he said, I must decrease so that he might increase. And that's what it's all about. That's what the Christian life is all about. The Bible doesn't promise you an easy life. The Bible doesn't promise you health and riches. The Bible promises you a saving relationship with Jesus Christ that will last forever. And you need to remember, as my mom is fond of saying, this life that we're living now is the shortest part of eternity. After we die and we awaken the presence of Jesus Christ, all the suffering that we've been through all the hurt, all the pain, all the sickness fades away. And life really begins. And we haven't earned that. Our king did that for us. Our king did that for us. Next week, we pick up with this series. And we move into what's called the intertestamental period. This is the period between Malachi and the Gospels. What was going on there? Because that period, what I'm going to argue next week, a lot of things happened in that period that, that twisted people's view of the Messiah so that when the Messiah finally came, they didn't recognize him. How many people were at the foot of the cross saying, this must be done, this is the prophecy, this is what had to be done? Almost none. And yet now, looking back through the scriptures, we see it as clear as day. Why did they miss it? And why do we also twist today what we think God should look like? Because we do. 
we often try to tell God what God should look like and what should God should do. And that doesn't make any sense. You know, I love my son. I love him to death. I die for the little kid. He's my little nerd. I hope to keep him that way. Keeps him away from girls. And when he was real little, like three years old, two or three years old, he looked at me one day over dinner and he said, Daddy, when do I get to make the decisions? I said, Jackson, I love you, but if I let you make the decisions, this house would be a smoking pile of rubble in 15 minutes. And yet we do the same thing with God. We look at God and go, why don't I get to do it? Why don't you give me this? Why don't I get to? We miss it sometimes because of what I'm talking about now, that selfishness. That thinking that what we want is what we need. And what we want is often the exact opposite of what we need in order to grow, in order to love others and not just love ourselves. So that's where we're going next week. And then the week after that, Dad will be preaching on the angelic announcement to Mary and to Joseph. And then we'll have our Christmas Eve service. Now, in your bulletins, you have cards where you can invite people to the Christmas Eve service. Let me just tell you this. If somebody already has a church where they preach the Bible, don't invite that person. They have a church. Invite somebody who doesn't have a church to come. That's the only people we want invited here. We don't want to steal people from other churches. We want people who have never heard the gospel, who don't know the gospel, don't know scriptures. That's who we want here with us on Christmas Eve. Make sense? All right, let's pray and we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the scriptures, all 66 books. We thank you that we see in them that it all points to you. We see these human beings in the Old Testament be given a task and fail or not complete it perfectly or do it for some selfish desire. Then we see you come along in the New Testament and complete all of those tasks perfectly and selflessly. Not for yourself, but for us. We thank you for your scriptures, for your life, for your death, for your resurrection. We thank you that you pray for us continuously. The scriptures say you and the Holy Spirit actually pray to the Father for us. We thank you for that. We thank you that one day you will return and set up your perfect kingdom here on earth. Where we will live with you without a care in the world. And finally come to the realization that all we ever really needed was you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God goes with you. Please be uh, generous with less fortunate as you go. Sign up for Angel Trees Deliveries and go save me a seat at the restaurant. See you. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.